Welcome to Hope Church. Uh, wonderful time worshipping as always together. My name is Tim and uh, my privilege is to bring the word of God to you this morning. If you have a Bible, can I invite you please to turn uh, to Acts chapter 2. Uh, in a moment I'll be reading from verse 41. Acts chapter 2. As a church, we're going to be going through the book of Acts in this coming year. We really want our church to be shaped by the word of God. We, we recognize it's a high privilege and responsibility to teach the Bible, to, to claim to be a church even. That's quite a responsible thing. That seems quite a big deal to me. And what kind of church do we want to be? What kind of church do we aspire to? to be like and our conviction is the place we need to go to find answers to those questions is the Bible and in particular the book of Acts which tells the story of the beginning of the church how it came to exist and how it is now 2,000 years on over every generation there have been great gatherings of believers who have claimed to know Jesus and, and for him to have changed their lives. Huge claims. Can anyone make that claim here today? A show of hands. If you know Jesus and you know he's changed your life, I think there's a few of us. Look at all those hands. And if, if you can't put your hand up today, the thrilling thing is this. You can meet Jesus today. He is our magnificent king, our magnificent savior. And yes, he died but he rose three days later. Right now, there really is, it's worth applauding, it's worth applauding him. Right now, there really is a man with flesh in heaven who one day will return and we'll all see him in that magnificent moment and he's revealing himself to men, women and children this very instant. I believe he wants to do that here today. So, let's read our passage. So, Acts chapter 2, verse, uh, from verse 40 to the end of the chapter. With many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, that is Peter, who's just been preaching, saying, be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Every day, they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Every day, the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we thank you so much that in these words you have placed power, power to reveal to, to our hearts your wonderful, wonderful son who came to bring hope and salvation and healing to this world. And he is bringing hope and he is bringing healing and he is bringing salvation into this world. And so many of us here can claim to have personal experience of that reality and I ask you by your spirit that you would shine that light once more upon Jesus and his glorious face, that we would be changed by him to live our lives obediently for him, to celebrate in this world the good thing that he has done to reach people like us. Help me and help us today, I pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. So the passage began by telling us 3,000 people were added to their number. Their number before that moment was 120. What do you do when overnight 3,000 people join your church? <laughs> overnight, 3,000 people. That is a massive change, isn't it? 
So before this point, there'd been 120 of them. They'd been in a room together. Well, that changed overnight, didn't it? 120. They would have known one another. They probably could name everybody pretty easily. Everyone got the opportunity to hang out with their favorite apostle. Everyone got to contribute quite effortlessly within the context of that church. It was comfortable. It was familiar. And then 3,000 people join in overnight. How different would our church feel if overnight 3,000 people joined? (laughs) Richard's up for the challenge. (laughs) What would change for you? What are the things that you enjoy? The comforts maybe that we experience in this church. And we're a, by the grace of God, we're a growing church. I, I love the role I have as a pastor here. It's a huge privilege. I love this role. But my wife will tell you my greatest strain and frustration every Sunday is leaving knowing that there are so many of you that I don't know. And there are so many names that I don't know. And there are some names which I should know and don't know. But I want to know. And it can, it can f- pain and frustrate me. Overnight, 3,000 people added. Overnight. So clearly, there is a necessity for what the church is meant to be that doesn't necessarily hinge upon one individual knowing everybody's name. Because as brilliant as Peter and the other other apostles were, that's quite a feat overnight to achieve. So clearly there had to be some multiplication of the care of these individuals in order for this church to continue and to belong and to be integrated together. There had to be priorities for them. There had to be things which were necessary. And it's a really important question, I think, for us to ask. What is necessary for the church to do? Because we can come to a church, and maybe you're even visiting this church today for the first time and checking us out, wondering, is this a church I can join? Well, what do you see as necessary for a church to do? What's necessary? What should the church be? What should the church do? And wonderfully, we have been given a fantastic answer to that question here in this text. We're immediately told what happened after the 3,000 were added because the story didn't end there. As magnificent as that was, Peter preached and 3,000 are saved, and what he doesn't do is go on a kind of revival tour and gather stadiums full of people and just go, I'm trying to get as many responses to my preaching as often as I can. He's committed to something beyond that. He's committed to something beyond that. And it's really important that we realize this. You see, Jesus, he's been preparing the disciples. Through the gospel, we find Jesus preparing them for what was going to come. He told them all kinds of extraordinary things were going to happen. He didn't tell Peter what was going to happen after his first preach. That would be quite an extraordinary thing to be told. Your first sermon, 3,000 people are going to get saved. What? I wonder if it's ever happened since a first-time preacher saw 3,000 saved. But we're not going, oh, but Peter was extraordinary. We're going, isn't God extraordinary for how he worked through this this individual to reach people. It's actually the extraordinary saving power of God. But Jesus said to Peter this. He said, you're going to, if you follow me, I'm going to make you fishes of men. That was after the miraculous catch of fish, if you remember the story. They cast the nets. The nets were bursting. They couldn't, they couldn't pull the nets in. They needed others to help them get the nets in. He says, follow me, and I'm going to make you fishes of men. I think it's fair to say this first sermon is an extraordinary catch, so to speak, 3,000 right away. But he didn't just say that you're going to be fishes of men. Because on the resurrection morning, one of the resurrection mornings with Jesus on the beach, he spoke to Peter and he said, if you love me, do you love me, then feed my sheep. So the next thing he's called to be is a shepherd. 
So two very clear priorities for these apostles, to fish, as it were, and to shepherd. To be a witness to Jesus being resurrected, and then to disciple. It's not sufficient for a church just to be a place where, as it were, we simply call people to give their lives to Jesus to tick a box in terms of numbers of hands raised to say, yes, I want to follow him, and, and we consider that job done. Now, he, what did he say to them in Matthew 28? He said to them, go to all nations and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That to be those who bear witness, that to be those that make disciples, that to fish, that to shepherd. And so a responsibility upon every local church ever since has been to do those two things. And so it really matters that you not only come and find on a Sunday morning a place to worship, but you come and you find a church into which you can grow up into all that Christ has called you to be. That you come and you find that you are becoming ever increasingly and progressively like Jesus. Discipleship. Becoming like him. Wow. Who would like to become a little bit more like Jesus? I want to become so much more like him. And I need you to help me become like him. I need your help. I need what's in these words, these pages before us. The 3,000 people were added as a consequence of gospel proclamation. It's absolutely vital. It's absolutely necessary. I don't want anyone ever to come to a service here and not hear about what Jesus has done for them. I never want anyone to come into this building on a Sunday when we're gathered and, and to leave without being told that God loved them so much he sent his only begotten son so that if they believe in him, they won't perish but have everlasting life. I want people to come in here and to learn that God became a man and lived a perfect life and was crucified as an innocent person acting as a substitute on our behalf, taking a judgment that was ours upon himself and fulfilling all that was required and rising again three days later, conquering sin and death and making a promise to everyone who believes in him that they too, one day, will be raised to new everlasting life. I want everyone to hear that every time we gather because those are the words that bring about this kind of transformation, the proclamation of the gospel. And the gospel is a display of God's devotion. So we are told here, they devoted themselves. And we're going to think about what that word devoted means. But the first thing I want you to see is that it came about as a consequence of God's devotion. He gave. He gave. That word devoted, when it says they devoted themselves to a whole load of things, it doesn't just mean this church quite liked listening to the teaching of the apostles or this church quite liked breaking bread. That word devoted is a very loaded word. In fact, in our English, the, the kind of the Greek word, like the English word, it connotes, it denotes a giving of oneself. Devoted. They were devoted. God's devotion to you meant that he sent Jesus. He gave. It was costly. If you're devoted to something, you're willing to give for it, to display your affection and your love towards it. Devotion is costly. And this church is characterized by costly, devoted love. If we want to know what, what is real, true love, it's a love that doesn't grasp but gives. So the father doesn't grasp hold, he gives. The son doesn't grasp hold of his equality with God. He became a human. He gave, he gives. And a devoted church, which is the church we're looking at, is one that says, I want to give. I want to express and display my love in that particular fashion and in that particular way. 
So what was it that they were devoted to? They're devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Those are the things that they were devoted to. Those were their priorities. They shared everything. They had all things in common. Overnight, this church of 3,120 people suddenly shared everything they had with one another. Suddenly. You see, the preaching of the gospel resulted in a cut to their hearts, we're told. They were cut to the heart. They said, what must we do? And the first response was a response before God, which was, I repent, I turn, I put my faith in you. I will be baptized. We've got baptisms in a couple of weeks' time. If you're a professing believer in Jesus Christ and you haven't been baptized, you need to be. You need to be. And we would like to baptize you here. And in a couple of weeks' time, you can. And we'd love to speak to you afterwards if that is you. They were baptized. But again, there was a next step. There was a consequence. Not only have their hearts been opened to adoring God, but suddenly they're looking around at one another with real love and with, with real affection. And they're sharing their lives with one another. They are giving to one another. They are investing in this community, and it's powerful. We need one another. Amen? I cannot be a Christian independent from a source of power, which is the Spirit of God, and from the context of a family, which is the church of God. A sheep without a shepherd, a sheep without a flock, is in danger. In Hebrews 10, we have these famous words. In Hebrews 10, verse 23 to 25, it says this, Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. That verse can sometimes be used as a stick to beat people with, unfortunately. It says here you should be gathering. You've missed church this Sunday. You're very naughty. I don't think that's the heart of the text. The heart of the text is to say, come on, keep gathering. Keep, keep being together. Keep being with one another. But it qualifies it. Not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other. Why do we gather? To encourage each other. You have an encouragement to give every time the church gathers. Do you know that? You can encourage people in various ways, with a hug, with a kind word, with a spiritual gift, with a prayer. You can walk across a room and see the person sat on their own without anyone to talk to and introduce yourself. I wonder if you know what it's like to come into a room like this and not know anyone. It's quite intimidating. You can come and be an encouragement to people. You have a contribution to give. We are mutually encouraged by one another as we worship together and as we gather. We gather to encourage. That's why we gather. It seems very simple and very meaningful. They gathered together. They honored one another. They appreciated one another. Encouragement goes a long way, doesn't it? When someone comes alongside you and says, you're really great. I am. Last night, as this guy's uh, had a little birthday party, just over the corner, I'm just going to embarrass Michael. There he is. There he is. I won't won't give you the number. But... um, we, we were led to just share things about Michael that we really appreciated. And uh, we, just, we just went around the table and we shared things about Michael that we really appreciated. Now, what you don't know is Michael's a pro golfer. So Michael, the other... Sorry, I've totally exposed you now. You're going to have so many people asking for tips, the swings. So, so Michael took me to the driving range a few months ago. He said, Tim, come to the driving range. We'll hit some balls together. Now, I hadn't got, swung a golf club in years. Literally, I said, Mike, I'm going to be so ropey. I've not swung the golf club in years. And 
at the end of it, I was convinced I could be a professional golfer. <laughs> I came back and I said to my wife, I like, Michael thinks I'm really good. He thinks I'm really good. And, and the kids are like, really? He said, yeah, Michael thinks I'm really good. He thinks I've got, you know, I've got, I've got potential. And, uh, and then so my kids were like, take me to the driving range. So I took the boys to the driving range, and I was absolutely terrible. <laughs> now, the reality is, honestly, the more I reflected on it, it wasn't so much that I was really good when I was with Michael, but really bad when I wasn't. What was the difference is that he has the gift of encouragement. <laughs> And so the whole while, he was saying, that was brilliant. Well done. That was great. And then when I didn't have Michael there encouraging me, I felt like my whole game deteriorated as a result. Now, my point is just simply this. It's not just ones or twos who are required or called to do that. We are all to encourage one another. Now, if we as a church feel that sense of responsibility... If we as a whole church are saying, you really blessed me today, that contribution was so helpful. Hey, seeing you here today, knowing what you're going through, I just want you to know it really blesses me. It's really encouraged me. Simple words of encouragement, devotion. Now, my friend, listen, if you're sat here thinking, well, no one comes over and speaks to me like that, you're missing the point. The point is, who are you speaking to like that? It's giving, not grasping. What difference are you seeking to make? They were devoted. They were devoted. And it marked them out. It was an extraordinary quality that overnight the Spirit of God put into them. Some people do have the gift of encouragement, but I think it's one of those things we're all called to do in various ways and various settings. So I just want to focus quickly on the particular things that they devoted themselves to. So to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and to prayer. The apostles' teaching. In John 14, verse 26, Jesus said this to the disciples. He said, The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. These disciples, these 3,000 plus, they just were plying, I can imagine, questions at the apostles. Tell us more about what Jesus did. Tell us more about what Jesus taught. How did he speak to the Pharisees? Did he really say that? Did he really raise Lazarus from the dead? We've heard these accounts, we've heard these reports. Tell us, teach us. Now, in those days, of course, they didn't have a Bible or the Gospels to just go to. It was the oral tradition, the retelling of the stories. And the apostles would retell the stories over and over and over. And, of course, in time, they were written down. And the accounts of the life of Jesus is what we have in these Gospels. But in these early days, it was what they wanted to hear. Tell us about Jesus Tell us about who he is. Teach us the word of, the, of God. And I don't know how they organized themselves, but I imagine 3,000, they had the 120 integrated, dotted around the various groups that the, the apostles were continually moving around and teaching and sharing the accounts of the life of Jesus and the words of the life of Jesus, and they just couldn't get enough. And you might be sat here thinking, wouldn't that be amazing to have those first-hand accounts of his life, to listen and to hear these things being told to you. But of course, you do have these words. You do have these first-hand accounts. You do have the gospel. This is why we must be a people that see the privilege we have of opening the word of God, of reading scripture, of reading scripture when we're gathered together and reading scripture when we're in one another's homes, that we open the Bible and like Mary, we sit at the feet of Jesus, our rabbi, our teacher, and we listen to him. A sad day when you think you know everything there is to know about Jesus and the gospels. So much to grow in, so much to learn, so much to enjoy. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. If you are here wondering about joining a church, what 
are the necessary features, I would say number one, number one, is that the Word of God is central. Number one, more important than the coffee quality, believe it or not, more important, more important even than the welcome you receive, as important as that is, more important is that there is light and life because the Word of God is read. Number one, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. And the second thing we're told is that they were devoted to the fellowship, to the fellowship. They were devoted to one another. This word comes frequently in Acts, and it's a word that's particularly seeking to emphasize the peculiar way in which all of these people from different cultural backgrounds have found themselves as one big family, a huge family together. They were devoted to the fellowship. And this isn't clearly just ad hoc Sunday attendance. They met in the temple courts all together, and they met in each other's homes. From house to house, they gathered together. And how they were with one another, how they lived together, as it were, how they studied the word of God together was a witness to the world around. Now, this is, again, something that Jesus said. He said this is what it's going to be like in John 13. I do have these verses. John 13, verses 34 to 35, says this. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this, everyone will know if you are really my disciples. Francis Schaeffer, the wonderful Christian leader of the previous century, he, he said this, Jesus is giving the world permission to judge whether we are true Christian disciples on the basis of whether we love one another. Jesus is, as it were, giving permission to everyone outside of the church to judge us, to assess whether we really are what we claim to be, the disciples of Jesus, on the basis of, do they love each other? And, and not just do we love within this congregation, do we love the church and other Christians and other congregations, how we talk, how we talk about one another, do we love one another? This is a gospel issue. Jesus has made it a gospel issue. They will know if you're truly my disciples by how you love one another. So yes, it matters if you are harboring bitterness towards a fellow Christian. Really matters. It matters if you are talking unkindly and cruelly about another Christian or another church. Now, it's not wrong to say I think that they're in error or to highlight an error or a false teaching. That's not what we're talking about, because to highlight that in a relational way, to go and to bring a challenge, is to pursue love, right? What we're talking about is the unkind behaviors that we can tragically so often see, and the divided church is a shame to the gospel. A church in conflict with each other is a damaging witness to a broken world that needs to find healing and wholeness and unity. So it really matters. And we are really being watched and observed. Are they really who they say they are? Do they really know God? Is God real? Is Jesus really God? They seem to always be arguing. They seem to always be fighting. They seem to always be in disagreement. So let me urge you, if there's an unresolved conflict in your life with a fellow believer, you need to deal with it quickly. You might need help with that, but you don't let those things fester. We must not let those things fester like the yeast that works its way through the dough. It needs to be dealt with and it needs to be confronted. They went from house to house. You know, across the centuries of the history of the church, I mean, the Lord has this perspective. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were able to take a snapshot through every generation of the church through time and just to see what the gatherings looked like, to see what they wore, 
what they sung, what instruments they had or didn't have, to observe the church over the centuries, you would see a lot of variation, wouldn't you, in terms of the buildings that they meet in? But I tell you, one consistent thing you will see is that Christians through every generation, through every age, gather in homes to worship, gather in homes to pray, gather in homes to break bread. It is a crucial and central feature to the church. In fact, I'd go further and say to some extent, I do believe the vitality and the health of a church is seen not so much in moments like these, but in how we are as we disperse and as we gather and how we are in the context of small groups. Because it can be easy to kind of, as it were, gather a crowd and entertain a crowd so people want to come back and sit, but then to leave and that's it. That's not what was happening here. They did gather in the larger settings, but then they dispersed into homes where they shared their lives together, where they broke bread together, where, where, where there was need, it was addressed and it was dealt with, where they prayed. Small groups is a high priority for us as a church. At the end, I'm going to ask Jonathan, one of the pastors here, to, sh to share how you can connect with a small group. Over my time in church, it's been a highlight for me to be in various homes, breaking bread, praying with fellow Christians. It's a powerful witness. A few months ago, I believe I may have made reference to this before, but I'm not sure. But a few months ago, a friend brought somebody, um, a, a lady in this church had brought a friend along. This friend was a very passionate atheist. And, and she said to me, uh, would you mind speaking to my friend who's a passionate atheist? She's got lots of questions. And it was one of those moments, here we go, what's going to happen now? And this person was so well thought through, very clever, very insightful, made some very challenging observations and asked some very difficult questions. I think it was fair to say that she passionately disliked the teachings of the Bible. And as I was reading the Bible, it wasn't so much my interpretation of the text, but the text itself that she was very angry with and couldn't get on board with. But then she was looking around and she said, but, this is, honestly, this is what happened. She said, this is special. She looked around and she, she was pointing at people praying together. She was observing people embracing one another. She was observing a diversity of people in the room different backgrounds, nationalities, ethnicities, ages. And she said, I don't see this anywhere else but in the church. I, I'll give you that. You seem to do community really well. <laughs> By this they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. It was a witness to her. The thing that she said, I can't believe this. I, I, I can't accept Jesus. I can't accept the Bible. But I'm puzzled by your community. And I think it's special. And I believe God was working in her, her heart. She, we, we, we ended up praying together. And she was weeping at the end of it. Moves. And you, you know, you trust God that he's working in her life. Don't underestimate the power of a church that loves each other. So actually the greeting does matter. The fellowship does matter. How we relate to one another really does matter, my friends. They broke bread. That clearly did mean eating meals together, but there's also clearly in this an allusion to the Eucharist or to communion. The worship act that Jesus established, right? He said, you will break bread together. You will drink the wine together. You must do this. You should do this when you gather. And they were committed. They were devoted to doing just that. They broke bread together. It's a necessary act of worship for the church to break bread together. Communion is a necessary feature for the church when it gathers. 
Because, of course, what does it do? It keeps Christ at the very center. Spurgeon said, the moments that we are closest to heaven are those we spend around the Lord's table. The great preacher from the 19th century said that about communion. They were devoted to prayer, praising God and prayer. I love that we are praying all the time as a church. I have been thrilled at our prayer meetings recently. We, we have a prayer meeting at the beginning of every month, the first Sunday of every month. We meet in the back. We are so packed now in our prayer meetings that we're coming into this big auditorium because more and more of you are turning up to pray, and isn't that wonderful? 7.30 to 8.30, the first Sunday of every month, we gather to pray. I urge you, join us. They're powerful, wonderful times where we seek God. They were devoted to prayer. We, I have received countless, genuinely, requests for new prayer meetings to start across the church in recent weeks. I think I've had about four or five separate people say, I'd like to start a prayer meeting. It's very encouraging. <laughs> when the people of God are praying, it's a very encouraging thing to observe. We are committed to it. And it was wonderful how Vicky led us in prayer just now, for those who are in education. Um, and we are praying. Every time we gather, we are devoted to prayers in the same way that the early church was devoted to prayer. They were a devoted people, and it says, and the awe of God came upon them. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles, things which we believe carry on to this day through spiritual gifts. The power of God on display and moving amongst us. Even now, I believe that God will be speaking to people with words of knowledge for others. Spiritual gifts to edify, encourage, and strengthen the church. You have a God who loves to give good gifts to his children. So expect to receive them. They knew a sense of his power and presence and awe. And I love how the passage ends. It ends by saying, every day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Extraordinary. Jesus gathered 120 disciples. Overnight, after Peter had preached, 3,000 were added. Isn't that amazing? Jesus could have done it all himself in that sense, but he chose to use them. And it wasn't that they were devoted to Peter's teaching, but the apostles' teaching. It's not about one person or one individual or one personality other than the person who is Jesus Christ himself. So all the teaching and the prayer and the praise is directed towards him. There's no celebrity in the church other than Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It's about him and it's for him. And we must be a people that are directing our prayer and our praise and our worship and our teaching to him. So... I'm going to conclude now. Practical steps. If you are looking at joining this church or if you're a part of this church, here are some practical steps. Join a group if you haven't done so already. Jonathan later on is going to tell you how you can do that. Come to our prayer meetings. Come and be a part of our prayer together. We love to pray as a church. Open your home. Be willing to share your things where you see need. Express generosity. Outdo one another in showing honor. Isn't that a wonderful command? I love that. I heard someone refer to this. Outdo one another showing come on. It's like he's encouraging you to be competitive, but everyone wins, right? Outdo one another in showing honor. I love that command. How can we encourage and honor one another? Let's this be a church and a culture where we do that. Okay, why don't the band come up? They're going to lead us into a song, after which Jonathan is going to briefly speak to us. Why don't we stand? And we're really thinking today about the church that we're aspiring to be. We're seeing lots of evidence of these things in our church, but there are many ways in which we'd love to see more. And God is working to achieve that. So let's pray. We thank you, Father, that um, the church isn't man's idea, but yours. It's your wisdom. It's how you've determined to reach the nations through your body, through your people. I pray that Hope Church would be full of people who are eager to be an encouragement to the fellowship, to one another, 
and to share this with this world around us. And I pray that as people look in on us as a church, they would say, gosh, you really do seem to love one another. There really does seem to be a real sense of togetherness here and that it would be a witness. It would be a witness to you, Lord Jesus, that you really are alive and you really are someone that we know and love. I pray, Lord, would you lead us into greater unity and togetherness with the wider church. Forgive us where we say things we regret, we shouldn't say. Help us to stand side by side with our brothers and sisters around the city, nation, and around the world to pray for them, to encourage them, to not be navel gazers, Lord, but to be a healthy, vibrant, growing, united body, because I believe these things bring glory to you. Thank you, Lord. We love you.